Uh, it's about insect suffering, so um, I guess that could be used as an argument against veganism. Uh, if insects can suffer, that might play a role since all the pesticides that are used for grain. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I'll just do a quick intro. So we're going to have a debate. Slayer and Flacid are going to be debating the proposition that Slayer holds that hunting is beneficial to the environment. Flacid is going to be taking the opposition. The winner is going to be based upon who concedes. If we don't hear a verbal concession from anyone, we're just going to put it to a voting poll in the debate chat text channel. If it does come to a voting poll, please base your vote on who you think performed better, who had the better argumentation, and who opposed the opposition better. If you're vegan, don't just vote for the vegan. If you're carnist, don't just vote for the carnist. And yeah, with that, you guys can get started. All right. All right. Um, as the proponent slayer, do you want to start? Sure. So I chose the proposition hunting is be beneficial for the environment. Um, I expect the, the way that we go about handling this proposition is first off establishing like what, what do we mean by hunting? Of course, I mean within reason. I don't mean like hunting a species to extinction. I don't mean um, violating like park ranger orders or conservation efforts. I think that these regulations are evidence-based and I have evidence to back up my claims. I hope that you might have something too that I could look at and we can get to the bottom of this, whether hunting is actually beneficial for the environment. Okay. Um so I think it's curious that you want to avoid um, kind of the hunting to extinction arguments, poaching arguments, considering those are the most, uh, well, at least poaching is one of the most prolific forms of hunting. Um, I mean, it's a billion dollar industry. Um, and I, I almost, I don't want to, I don't want to come off as too confrontational, like right out of the gate, but um, I think it's a little dishonest to, exclude the hunting to extinction when that has um, taken place, you know, several times, even in the last hundred years. Well, I, I, I mean, I don't think that species extinction is beneficial to the environment. So that's not really like how I take the debate prop to be right. Um, what I really mean to say is like to steal man hunting instead of like giving like illegal cases or cases where regulations weren't imposed, um, giving it a fair chance and really seeing like what the data says um, to end taking that and seeing where, seeing what it at, where it can go. And I think like going to situations of like poaching and stuff where like there's no regulations imposed is, it is going to take like the weakest case of the proposition Sure, you might like lend like some trivial points there, but really the the strong point is what I want to focus on for the purpose of this discussion. So you want to focus on legal hunting then? Yeah. Okay. Um, and again, I'm I'm open to like being persuaded like the law should be altered or like regulations should be shifted, but uh, I'm depending on what what the data says, right? Um, so it. I'm not claiming that the current hunt, hunting regulations are 100% optimal. I think that mm. humans have a lot to learn. I think we have a long way to go. But um, based on the evidence that we do have, we should be acting in accordance with that in, or, in order to maximize the diversity of ecosystems. Okay. Um, I mean, initially, I'm, I'm skeptical of some of the data that like Fish and Wildlife Services uh, collect and use because they are inherently biased towards data that is going to be pro hunting considering that's where their revenue comes from. Um, and a lot of the people that sit on fish and wildlife boards themselves are hunters. And so they have an interest in preserving that. So when, when you talk about data supporting the regulations, there's, there's the data that supports the regulations, but then there's the interpretation of the data that I find is often skewed. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I can sympathize with that. Uh, I think that there's a lot of industry funded research, which a lot of the time comes out in favor of, uh, of industry. Um, 
but I don't think that that's what makes like the study flawed, right? Like I might, I might actually have a greater skepticism when reading a, a study, right? But typically it's funded, right? And big dollars pay for studies, right? So it has to come from somewhere. So I don't think that that's going to 100% discount a study. Um, you can take a look. The, look the, the main one that I want to focus on is this one today. I'll, I'll link it in debate chat. So this one was actually funded by the um, uh, French Ministry of Research and Education, um, and uh, funding was also provided by the forced renew forced renew forced renewal sorry of British Columbia. Mm -hmm. So this is a really interesting paper, um, which deserves a lot more attention. Um, they're looking for is uh, how bird div diversity and plants biodiversity um, responds to the culling of deer. And um, they kind of just, they called 80% of the deer. Uh, this happened in British Columbia and they followed up in 13 years. So they wanted to see long-term what are the impacts to each ecosystem. So there's, several islands and they had um they had a control island so they counted all of the the species um on each of these islands and on on the one that they were testing they called 80 percent of the deers uh on two medium-sized islands and they monitored the, the changes over those those 13 years uh the results are so the control group actually saw a decline in, in biodiversity. You saw the, the deer um, eating the understory vegetation. And certain birds actually rely on uh, those. So uh, on, the, on those islands that we saw the deer called, we saw a massive proliferation in abundance of varieties of, of rare birds that rely on those understories. And also we saw, of course, like a ton more of, the, uh, of vegetation that are normally just devoured by the deer. So given that there's a con control group here, we can see objectively with just like one feature, right? There's, these are largely un uninhabited. So uh, human interaction isn't going to be like playing any kind of uh, role. Given that this is the case, I, I don't, I don't really see like what even the case would be against hunting. Like, like this is like pretty clear. Um, uh, you can just read through the main conclusions or I can post them in, uh, the right. Debate. Right. So I guess the primary contentions I have with this one is that these are taking place on islands. Um, and the fact that it's on an island and you can have this kind of eradication control just doesn't, um, work well when you have an open population where members of the species can come in and come out. Um, so I think for scientific purposes, the island works well, right? But I think in practice, outside of an island habitat, um, it doesn't always work well. The second, the second contention I have with it is that it just says culling. Um, and obviously we're referring to hunting here, but hunting isn't the only form of culling. You have things like predator reintroduction. And even in the introduction to this article, they talk about how these are both native and introduced species of um, deer. And the reason the deer population has been increasing there, if, if I'm reading this correctly, um, is from predator eradication, which means predator hunting. Um, and so it, it's hunting causing a problem and then hunting trying to solve that problem when really hunting doesn't need to be the primary method for solving the problem considering it caused the problem and the fact that these are in this case some of them are introduced species but not all of them are introduced species again if i'm reading this correctly um doesn't necessitate that they need to be called 
Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, like I agree, there could be some other thing that is also beneficial for the environment. So something like predator reintroduction, but that's not really, do, do you see that that's not really an argument against that hunting can also be beneficial for the environment? And it seems like, I mean, in this like large uh 13 year follow up uh, control study that hunting is clearly beneficial for the environment. I mean, hunting is one of the causes, though, that degraded the environment. Um, and even when you have target species here, you have to be careful with calling because there's indiscriminate calling. And then there's what I believe to be the more common version of calling, which is selective calling. And we've seen it in deer, especially that where you tell people to. Um, call 80% of the species or even less than that, you're, you're going to have um, artificial selection happening where they're going after the most charismatic of the species. They're going after the deer with the biggest antlers. They're going after the biggest deer, the most robust deer. And so you're removing the um, strong breeding potential of those populations. And so it, it makes the remaining members of the population have a weaker genetic potential moving forward. Um, And so this has been observed in the Northeast United States where the population of deer has, like the physiology of the deer themselves through the generations has changed to make a less robust deer than um, somewhere you would see, like in central Canada where there isn't um, as pervasive of culling measures. And so not only has hunting caused the problem on these islands, we may be introducing more with the um, genetic variables that are taking place. And as I mentioned with the native species that are there, um, it, it kind of seems like humans have played a role in environments historically where we try to play God and it comes back to bite us. And this, again, seems like a repetition of that. Well, like, okay, so I I hear you, and I mean, the funny thing is I I agree with a lot of that, but I don't see how that's really, like, again, it's taking, like, the weaker versions of hunting. It's not taking the steel man of hunting, and what I'm looking really to to understand and, and explore is if we assume hunters are being responsible, and, we're, and if we're applying what we know today, we know that if we're hunting the biggest, best buck, or if we're just killing indiscriminately, that's that's likely going to have a negative effect. And I mean, I mean, indiscriminate calling would be a way to avoid that. However, indiscriminate calling is very difficult. Um, so assuming you have a one-to-one ratio where you have uh, one hunter who takes one target species at a time, it makes it very difficult to be able to control for indiscriminate calling just because of what hunters are looking for. And so you would have to go to a a method of calling that kind of removes um, that hunter bias, if you will. But then you, you run the risk of incidental takings. So if you're using traps. Sorry. um, When you say hunter bias, do you mean like irresponsible hunters because i mean from no no no. i'm talking about responsible hunters who are looking the target species and they are going to take the target species however if you see a deer um you would have to have i guess trained biologists to know exactly how many of what uh how robust of deer have already been taken like the the data measurements to be able to actually have a neutral indiscriminate call i don't think that um i mean it's it's a it's a huge uphill battle um to make that case since i mean in this study they they called 80 percent of the deer um indiscriminately so you we don't eat we don't even hunt that many deer um per year uh, generally and every winter again like 30% 30% of deer usually die out. So we're hunting another percentage, but we're, we're, we're maintaining deer. We're actually increasing deer population uh, through conservation efforts. And I want to be clear, like to everyone, responsible hunters are not going to go out and just shoot the biggest, best trophy 
what I and conservation officials like all we all espouse um, hunting and informed hunting and we have these regulations for for data things like this paper I've shared and I I still think like hunting is beneficial for these reasons you can give me like poor examples right like I could if we're arguing about something something else like vegan health I could like cherry pick and point to bad examples of vegan health right but really like if we're trying to argue for something you want to take the steel man right like the best example you don't want to go to like these rent like these edge cases right well i don't think these are edge cases considering that this has been the trend that the art the artificial selection trend has been documented and it's also been documented that trophy hunting is a billion dollar industry there are people oh, yeah, that yeah, pay yeah, yeah, I, I, an exorbitant amount of money and the target species and the most robust members of those species are selectively targeted because they are of high value to a hunter. Right. And um, I totally agree on trophy hunting. I, you know, I'm sort of agnostic on whether the model works or doesn't work or if other models are better. And again, right. I, to me, right. If you showed me that in reintroducing natural predators were, were better for the environment, I mean, that might, that might persuade me personally to um, allow that instead. But again, I mean, it's, it's, it still wouldn't change the fact that it seems like in this 13 year follow up paper that hunting actually was supremely beneficial. I mean, we could go over the results further to see like what the actual numbers were to see how significant this was. Right. And again, these islands are completely isolated so repopulation of deer from like other islands swimming over it's not really likely so again it was like probably the one of the best ways to have this type of uh, this type of knowledge what what we've gained from this um i mean if you have contradictory da- data that would help um because i'm honestly trying to understand i'm trying to wrap my head around this because i know we've of course humans are are horrible. We've wiped out a lot of uh, natural predators, and I think that natural predators are a very good thing for the environment. Um, but with that, you know, in with that knowledge, right? I think that humans, since we cause this problem, we have to step up and and try to solve it with and and learn more. And I mean, that's how I even came across this paper because I was honestly searching for a way to help the environment. Okay, but I I do want to reestablish that hunting is what caused the problem on these islands. And the fact that it is on an island means that while it may have had an impact on the islands, it is not um, easily replicated in an open environment like a large continent. Um, I mean, I think that just adds more like confounding factors, which would make for a weaker analysis uh i mean if you have anything like to show that that would alter the results i'd i'd like to see it but um i think that the whole the reason why we did it on on islands is because it's a like a control environment all right um so what what say you to the proposition then that those deer are part of the environment? And so calling those deer in a violent manner and an artificial manner at that, um, even under the most responsible methods, um, is is beneficial for them. Well, I mean, I, I think it it really depends on like your definition of what you take to be an, an ecosystem or the environment and the deer play. Well, the environment world. would be the living and abiotic um, portions of a geography. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, to be honest, it's like a cheap angle, but like, like where this goes is, yeah. It, like someone could say that those deer are, are vastly more valuable to the environment than like rare bird species or like 
um, more more vers- versatile vegetation, like a healthier forest overall. One, I mean, one could argue that, but I think that that it's going to collapse eventually, right? Because we, because I, I would say how far that, like, let's just remove all other species except for deer. Uh, would you still say that's better for the environment? No, because I'm not trying to remove any of the species. So would you say that an incredibly biodiverse uh, ecosystem is less healthy than an ecosystem with like literally only deer and just enough food to feed feed just those deer? Well, so when we talk about ecosystem health, we're talking about its resiliency and its ability to rebound from catastrophe, right? So we're talking about an ecosystem's ability to weather the storm, if you will, and then be able to rebound from that. And so the arguments for biodiversity essentially um, assert that if you have a biodiverse ecosystem, if something like um, like a mold or a virus or something hit that ecosystem, it would not do as much damage. However, there are ecosystems that have formed naturally that do have a um, predominant species. It's usually a predominant plant species. um, But at the same time, if that is the, the natural stasis of that ecosystem it is not humans jobs um, to interject their will onto the natural selection of an ecosystem right i mean i mean are you rejecting that biodiversity is is a good thing or that it does contribute to the resilience of an ecosystem I mean, biodiversity definitely has its place in the discussion. There's no doubt about that. Um, However, our valuation of biodiversity, um, simply saying that more biodiversity is better is an oversimplification. Um, And I think you would agree that when we talk about ecosystems, we have to look at the individual ecosystems in and of themselves. Obviously, if you're to introduce new species, that would be creating more biodiversity. But as we've seen over and over again with introduced species, it often backfires. But that's that's not analogous to this, the the paper. I mean, they they didn't do that. I I can agree there. Yeah, I can agree. Invasive species are bad. Because they they can dominate uh, and disbalance an ecosystem, but the the species that were coming back, it was actually the mm-hmm. what. The- so There's, I I put a link actually, in. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Okay, I, I see the the link here, and um, yeah, just to be clear, like the proposition isn't all hunting is beneficial for the environment. So that's why I was like looking for the the steel man because like i wouldn't say all vegans uh, are good right there might be one that uh works for someone but i'm not going to say all vegan diets are are good right because you could just drink like soda and chips right so you could you could point to like horrible horrific cases so um just to be just to clear that up for anyone listening right so um the article that i linked i, I don't think it gives you full access to it unfortunately but you do get the abstract Um, And it's from the Yellowstone um, reintroduction. And so it just... Just just before we go to... Just before we go to... um, I'm just going to like navigate away from the paper that I linked above. So just to be clear, like you agree with the the methods and and the conclusion, which is that the islands with deer calling actually saw a massive uh, increase in natural biodiversity. And I mean, can, can we all just agree that that um, adds to ecosystem mm-hmm. resilience, uh, overall well-being of and health of that environment? I mean, sure, but I'm still not conceding the point that hunting is what caused those islands mm-hmm. to fall into the catastrophic state of overpopulation. And I'm also not conceding the point that hunting was necessary or even the most efficient method. No, no, no. I, I, I don't think it, it, I mean, I, I don't know what the most efficient method is, right? Like in a thousand years, we could come up with some, like, I don't know, sci-fi solution that fixes all of it. But so I don't know if it's like the best solution, but it seems like from the evidence that it it's, it's a good solution. And I mean, that's all I'm really arguing for. I'm not, I don't even have to set the bar that high. 
I'm still not convinced that it's a solution because 13 years isn't really enough time to measure population, um, like the demographics of a population. 13 years is a snapshot, really, when you're talking about it. So there's nothing to say that without natural predators, that deer population isn't going to rebound. Well, of course, I mean, I, like, I think it, it could, of course, rebound, but um, I don't, exp- I don't know why we'd set the bar higher than 13 years. I mean, 13 years is a long follow up for a study. Like, we'd be looking at like billions of dollars um, to have like a 50 year follow up study. It, it just costs so much money to pay those researchers for s- such a long follow up time. It's not even. It's not really realistic. I would love to see the data. I mean, if we had something um, like that or something to suggest that we should um, fund a study like that, I would I would be all ears. Um, I mean, I can't speak for British Columbia, um, but I do know in the that deer are one of the most often um, taken target animals for subsistence and sport and game hunting. Um, and so there is a lot of money that goes into those demographic studies and predicting Um, how many deer there are in a given habitat. Um, So I don't know that it would be that much more money to do it if they're already doing it. But that aside, I think that calling a Band-Aid solution like hunting a a full stop solution is disingenuous um, to say that, oh, we solved the hunting problem with more hunting, but we're going to have to keep hunting. Look, the habitat is fixed doesn't really um, lead to a solution. If anything, it is serving the hunter's benefits more because they get to keep hunting. Um, just to be clear, because like it seems like one of your points was that the study was like funded by some hunting group or something like that. Uh, oh, no, no, no. no. I don't think the, it was funded uh, by a hunting group. Well, so the, the Canadian Wildlife Service of Environmental Canada um, – and the Latseek Bay Conservation mm-hmm. Society, uh, they provided all the logistical support. So that means like uh, estimated populations, uh, the dynamics of biodiversity and life history traits, and the French Ecological Society helped fund it. I I don't see any like direct... I'm not questioning their data. I'm sure their data is, is reliable. Um, however, I okay. think without further measures, it, it does allow for hunting on the islands to continue if just to maintain the current status quo. Well, I mean, I think hunting should absolutely continue on those islands. I mean, I mean, just look at what happened over the course of this 13 years. And again, right. If we just, if we keep the populations of, of deer within control, right. We'll say a, a natural predator, um, I don't see functionally, like ethically, you could make maybe some argument, but functionally, right? Like the natural predators are essentially doing that, right? They're, they're. Are we calling the humans the natural predators? No, they're unnatural predators. But I don't, I don't think that really matters, right? Because I mean, the result is, um, like clearly, um, I don't, I don't really see a, a distinction there. Well, it does matter um, because I don't think that we can really honestly call an environment a robust environment if it requires constant human intervention just to maintain um, falling backwards. Well, like if so, if, I mean, look, if I so I agree, right, if, if wolves were on these islands or if there was more, more wolves, I think that we would need that intervention. But if we're talking about um, if we're just talking about um, uh, just the impact that we do have, right? If we're only hunting and we only hunt, let's say per year, far less than 80%, let's just say it's like 10 or 5%, we're still going to see modest increases in the biodiversity, right? We might not see as much as like the 80%. And if you do take 80% in, per year, right, you're not going to, that's not going to be sustainable either. It was just a one time. Uh, experiment. So if we saw multi-year uh, culling, uh, I, I suspect you'd see a very similar result here. Uh, but I, I still don't see like any kind of like realistic symmetry breaker that would make this study like flawed or anything. But I mean, 
if we agree on the conclusions, we can go to the paper that, because I'm sure people are eager to see what paper you've cited. Right. So um, the paper I cited was simply talking about the Yellowstone um, predator reintroduction, and it was a response to the paper you cited, where the predator reintroduction um, allowed for a for the trophic levels present in that ecosystem to become more vibrant um, and to include more species in each trophic level. And so they were um, measure, if, if I'm remembering the study correctly, they were measuring the population of not only the highest trophic level predators, but also um, things like woodlouse. Um, so, so insects on on the lower trophic levels, um, and right, our goes right. It changed the flow of rivers, and it, it totally um, it, it had this incredible impact on the ecosystem in in the Yellowstone area. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm actually I'm aware of the the study, right? So the chance the deer stopped eating the uh, the flora in that area because that was the wolf territory. So the river could actually come back. The the land uh, could settle, regrow more more plants grew there. But the thing is, is I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure, right? Because we could just have called the deer, and you would have had a similar result to that. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if, I mean, unless you have a comparative analysis to say one's better than the, the other, right? But in which case, we just say they're both good. It just like seems like one's better, but that's not really the the debate proposition. But so we're I, talking like, about agree, what is I, better for the environment and having um, these predators have their natural abilities back and their natural ranges back and having a, a strong pack dynamic by sorry a strong pack dynamic and having a larger territory and having a better um, more varied selection of prey species that is a better environment well, that's 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 true um, but I don't think we could do this in every ecosystem either right there's still going to be ecosystems where um maybe the wolves were a natural predator so you're gonna you're gonna see better results and the humans might not be able to emulate uh that as effectively but you might see the the reverse too right like where wolves uh were never dominant and if you reintroduce them instead of like hunting you would have more well-controlled hunting regulations and codes um and Again, right, like in certain popul- or certain areas, hunters are encouraged uh, away from uh, f- the females so that you can still see the population numbers grow. Or if you're trying to reduce the population, you would want to hunt more females uh, just for like they're giving birth. So that, that's why that would be a factor. So you can control for these types of things where wolves aren't, aren't really going to discern, right? They're, wolves are really just going to go for, okay, who's the slowest, weakest, uh, youngest, oldest, or whatever. Um, like, who's who's the best meal for me right now? Whereas hunters, right, if we're talking about responsible hunting, would follow the target uh, uh, gender or age or or whatever. So this, this kind of argument you're making right could go in in either direction and i agree that reintroduction of natural predators is is in general a good thing but i don't see how it really attacks the proposition so i mean just to be clear it's not wolves it's predator reintroduction and so prior to intensive human intervention into ecosystems there were predators i mean if you look at the case of some islands Sure, there weren't predators in islands that were only inhabited by birds. But leaving aside those um, individual and rare instances, in most scenarios, we did have predators. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree. Um, and so... This is cold. It's, right. And, and I think you would agree that ecosystems are complex than just predator-prey relationships. We have uh, trophic cascades. So when we're talking about just calling prey species um, or just introducing predator species, um, we have to look beyond that. And so it's not just that the wolves eat the deer or that um, the, the cougars eat the rabbits 
or, or whatever right. kind of predator prey relationship you have there. It's also what does the prey itself eat? And what do any of those intermediary um, species eat as well? And so there's all, there's this whole web of consequences that we need to consider that humans just cannot control by removing a certain percentage of one population. Well, I mean, I mean, to that, to the trophic cascade point, uh, there's actually a far reaching trophic cascade that has been demonstrated, uh, in a paper in 2013. I can link it, uh, in a second. Uh, they went, they went into, uh, studying the result of very the consequences of having too abundant deer populations. So you're seeing declines in insects, declines in birds and, and small animals. Um, I can link that right here, but I mean, I'm sure you agree with the conclusions, yeah. right? Like deer must be controlled one way or another. Only because the overabundance of deer has been caused by the hunting of their predators. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, I totally agree, right? But I mean, also, right? We have to. Here's the stuff. Okay, so that that's just the consequences of overabundant deer. Um, so they have to be controlled, and if natural predators are removed. Uh, we have to deal with this issue one way or another. We have to get out of this situation. So reintroduction can work, uh, but I don't think, I mean, I'm just skeptical of that it can work in every single ecosystem. So we're going to have to, and again, we co-evolved with these species, right, through uh, millions of years. So humans have been hunting, and I, I still think that, there, that that relationship can't be discounted either. I mean, there's no way to really control uh, and remove humans from this evolutionary process because we we've, we've been here as well. So if humans have been having an impact and playing that role, I don't see why, um, given like in view of this research today, that we just stop or take our hand out of the the cookie bowl essentially. For as long, I know that this was an argument you wanted to avoid, but I think since you have invoked it about humans um, co-evolving with animals and hunting animals. Um, I think it's, I think it's fair to bring up at this point, but as long as humans have been hunting animals, we have been driving animals to extinction. Um, I mean, there's a a substantial body of evidence to show that uh, humans hunted woolly mammoths to extinction, that humans were the cause of the dodo extinction. Um, So even early on, um, in human evolution, this co-evolution, we have been driving animals to extinction through hunting. I actually agree, I agree that through many mechanisms, humans can drive other species to extinction. It could be just through our horrific consumptive habits, not even related to hunting. Um, but I, I mean, as far as I'm aware, it's not even it's not possible that like other predator species can also drive. Uh, other species to go extinct. Uh, it's not. It's not essentially like off the table that that can really happen. And I don't think that these, like our our ancestors, really had the science that we have today. And I mean, we're not killing indiscriminately. We're not killing f- just based off the need for survival. We're we're really combining all of it into. Um, an honest effort to help our ecosystems, which are failing. And and they will continue to fail unless we do something about it. And love this Yellowstone paper. Um, I think that we should probably be doing both of these things. All right. Um, so but I, I, I want to go back the, to what you said feeling, about... Okay, sorry, go on. I wanted to go back to what you said about, um, you know, best management practices and and the data back then was, I don't think that the intention behind the hunting has anything to do with whether or not the actual consequence of the hunting is good or bad for the environment. Your intentions can be very good, but I I mean, if you want to rely on the data, the data is not 
going to reflect the intentions. And so even though the hunting may have been for some devious mass consumptive need, or it could have been for pure subsistence reasons, it doesn't change the fact that humans hunted them into extinction and that we continue to do so. Oh yeah, no, I, I still think like hunting can be bad, but that, that doesn't mean that it's it's not necessary. And I think that the responsible deployment of it is good. Can you go ahead and, and define to me what you believe responsible hunting would look like? Well, I was sort of, I was very upfront about this at, at the beginning. So I, I believe I defined it as, uh, based on evidence, uh, following the local codes of conservation officers. I, I don't advocate anyone go hunting without, proper experience, uh, proper information, and, uh, of course, a license. All right. So, uh, but I, I also remember you bringing up something, even, even if you follow the law that may not be responsible hunting. Can, can I just ask a, like, just a question? So do you think if we outlawed hunting t- today, um, do you think that ecosystems would improve or get worse? If we stopped hunting? Yeah, just tomorrow, if no one was allowed to hunt deer anymore. Um, I think they would get better, but I think that sets a false equivalency or at least a false dichotomy there saying the only options are hunting or no hunting. And that's not true. I mean, we have other options. Um, when it comes to invasive species, we have um, hormonal controls and birth controls and immunocontraceptives. Um, we also have the ability to reintroduce predators, like I said, and we also have landscape and terrain measures that we can use to try and um, isolate populations so that they can't continue to grow. And so it's not it, the, the, the The question that you posed is, would environments be better if we stopped hunting? And I think that is, a dishonest question because it would put me into a box that that um, creates this false dichotomy that simply is not true. Well, I mean, I wasn't saying like that one situation is right based on like a dichotomous question. I don't think it is uh, like a a true false dichotomy. Um, I don't think that that's very like accurate. I mean, if I was saying. Um, these are the only two options uh, in in existence and forcing you to choose between those. Yeah, sure. But I was just wondering uh, if uh, it were the case that we just stopped hunting and we didn't do anything else, if that was the only thing we were, we stopped doing, uh, what, what would the result be? Um, I, th- I think you said it would be good for the environment. In, in most environments, I think it would be beneficial. Do you have any like evidence for that? And I mean, I know. That, I mean, I can um, show you a study that took place in the Amazon basin um, that sh- showed that the um, higher the higher um, the more hunting that was taking place in the areas, the less biodiversity was present, at least in terms of vertebrates. Um, they were only studying vertebrates. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to see if you have it on hand. That would, that would be interesting to go into. Um, were they? Was this? Was this like bush meat or subsistence? No. Hunting? Okay. I believe it was uh, limited to subsistence hunting. I have a couple yeah, because the open, so the thing with the thing with subsistence hunting is, I mean, these are people just like they have to hunt to feed themselves so they they need to subsist off something so there's there's not really the strictest regulations here right like of course i'm not going to argue in favor of irresponsible or unwise um hunting so let me just click through here so i think with subsistence hunting though it's important to recognize that subsistence hunting is simply not necessary in many areas 
But in those areas where it is necessary, it does not occur in a vacuum. And so subsistence hunters are competing for the same species and the same target species as trophy hunters, as poachers, as other consumptive uses. And so there is a argument to be made that subsistence hunting is contributing to the same negative effects. Now, I understand that it is essential for the humans, but it is certainly not beneficial for the environment. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so this is subsistence hunting... Like I, I, I thought in hunting, there there are major issues with um, with this form of hunting. Just um, b- basically, they're going against uh, conservation efforts. Um, so I wouldn't use this as an argument. I I don't. I really don't think it's like fair to saddle me with something like like to defend something like this. Um, of course, there's there's very very bad cases of of hunting that that I, you know, you could give me, and I wouldn't try to defend any of those. Uh, again, I'm talking I, about like purely necessity based subsistence hunting, and even the most responsible form of it. I'm trying to do this steel man for you, but as you know, it does not occur in a vacuum, and well, so if subsistence hunting is not the steel man, though. I mean, do you, so, I, I mean, what do you, what do you take the steel man to be? I just want to make sure. I'm trying to figure understand. out what you think the steel man is, because I, I mean, when we're talking about subsistence hunting and you invoke subsistence hunting as this necessity, I'm simply trying to um, contradict that. Well, I, so subsistence, so bushmeat essentially. Um, I'm not talking about bushmeat. I mean, you want well, to talk about bushmeat? We can talk about bushmeat, but I don't think you do. Okay. Well, of course I, of course I do. <laughs> um, so subsist subsistence hunting, um, just on on the sole fact that it goes against conservation efforts, or at at minimum, it doesn't align with conservation efforts um, and and pressures for more uh, controlled hunting. Again, in in America, we we almost wiped out all the deer, and there was hardly any deer a hundred years ago. And there's a strong correlation with um, the introduction of regulations. When were the deer almost wiped out? I haven't seen that. In the early 1900s, and they came back in whopping amounts, and now they're they're overabundant. But that that's due to the imposition of conservation. So I'm I'm in agreement with. I think that hunting necessarily needs to have control. If if we have no control, then we're just going to wipe out species uh, without, uh, as has been done historically. Okay, so let's talk about totally legal controlled hunting then. Um, the IUCN um, recently started a new initiative um, that tracks the online auction sales of totally regulated hunting. Um Now, we're talking about trophy hunting, um, but it is still a legitimate means of hunting that people engage in. And one of the defenses to trophy hunting is that oftentimes people pay um, to go into these remote villages, particularly in Central Africa or South America, and they pay these communities to be able to hunt the charismatic megafauna. Um, However, after looking at how much money was spent and where that money came, uh, came to be, the IUCM estimated that trophy hunting only accounted for between 0.3 or 0.03 and 0.06% of the total annual GDP in those 11 um, hunting countries um, and only 1.8% of the tourism revenue. And so it's really such a minor amount of money that they're receiving from these trophy hunting. And all of this is happening under a totally regulated, totally lawful regime. Right. Um, well, um, okay. So the, just to clarify, the the model is kind of like basically this. Uh, so you know, charge an extreme amount of money to hunt uh, like a rare or endangered species or just like large uh, large game. And then we're going to use a portion of that money to to go towards conservation efforts, and hopefully that's going to offset the the damage caused by 
by the, I mean, and again, right. Like you're, what they're essentially doing, I don't, I don't even know if it's really based on any kind of data. So like, I'm not, I'm highly skeptical of that model. I think that there are, there are other models, which when, when you're in that kind of situation where, I mean, no, no reasonable hunter, in my opinion, is going to say it's, it's fine to go and shoot endangered species or just, just for the sake of it, no matter how much money you're paying. But like, if it's something like deer, right, which I mean, most people hunt or human species, uh, or overpopulated species. Um, and again, right. Like we can debate exactly what that number is. Like that, that to me seems like where the debate should go. How much is, is too, too many deer per capita. Um, but these other areas I've seen other models and I think I do. So agree that- I'll send you the link to, um, this is a journal, um, that puts out the reports from the IUCN. So this is not the IUCN themselves. Um, however, I can send you the IUCN website, but I found it really difficult to navigate. Um, so this journal goes into those numbers that I just pulled up. And so I'm not really sure what model you're talking about, because this is a survey of the countries, the 11 countries that um, see the most trophy hunting. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm not, so one of the problems that I personally have with trophy hunting is you're, you're cherry picking the, the best, uh, specimen to kill, which should probably be allowed to live and pass on its genetics. Um, when we're seeing, um, trophy hunting, you're not going after like the ugliest or the weakest or the oldest or whatever. You're, you're actually seeing like the, the prizes, right, are typically, and that's that. That's my main contention with it is that they're they're specifically picking probably the worst specimen uh, ecologically to go and kill. That's probably why I'm like I I wouldn't dare defend trophy hunting. Again, I I also believe uh, if someone's going to go and hunt an animal uh, just to take it for a trophy, that's inherently wrong i think that if you're going to take a life you should be responsible for that and uh, the outflowing so i don't think that this is something i'm really like going to challenge you on i don't think that i've from the outset um of this debate i've i haven't ever espoused trophy hunting so it's not even like really a a concession well so then i'm confused with what kind of hunting we're supposed to be debating because I'm providing totally legal means of hunting, which I thought we established were the responsible means. But now we're going back and saying that the legal means are not the responsible means and that we should be going after not charismatic megafauna, not endangered species, which leads me to, I guess, subsistence-based hunting, which, well, again, we already espoused. So I think like another criteria that I, <clears throat> sorry, that I have is, uh, I think I stated this from the outset, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I said that they should align with data and conservation efforts. And I, I don't think trophy hunting qualifies. Uh, I mean, the, the trophy hunting is taking place under the name of conservation efforts. But I, I look, I, I don't even... Like I haven't seen in any data in favor of trophy hunting. Like I would never go and espouse this. This seems like trying to shoehorn me into a position that I don't hold. And so, like I've, so I've said it's from the safe to say then that we both agree that trophy hunting is not beneficial for the environment. Yeah, I mean, trophy I, hunting. I'd say that from the start, and I'd I'd say that now, right? I mean, unless because I've I've looked into trophy hunting, and like there's the data is not good for it. Um, in terms of actual conservation, right? So I, I don't even think that I ever put that shoe on. I okay, so we can totally get rid of of trophy hunting. Um, I'm I'm just yeah. trying to figure out what kind of hunting we're talking about. We're not talking about subsistence hunting, right? Yeah, and we're not talking about trophy hunting. Are we talking about game hunting then? And we already said we're not talking about poaching. No, well, I, so to me, right, just personally is, um, 
I come from a family of hunters um, myself. I was I was raised to when you when you pull that trigger, you're responsible for what happens, no matter what. And that's how I learned to use the entire animal. And uh, if you're taking something out of an ecosystem, um, it should be for the benefit of that ecosystem. It shouldn't be to the detriment. So that's the philosophy of responsible hunters. Uh, I don't think that their premise is, is wrong, right? I, I do think that they have to be careful about what they do, though. And I, I mean, I've been very clear about that. So I can see how that would be a personal ethic. However, it has been my observation with uh, conservation boards, fish and wildlife, um, that they manage species for humans, not necessarily for the environments. And so they set these regulations based off of human expectations, human wants and desires, and human management of those ecosystems and of those hunted species. And so while your personal ethic may be that a responsible hunter is one that only hunts for the good of the environment. That simply is not the case in the regulations. And so I, I commend you on your personal ethic. However, I don't think that it is um, totally doable to be able to hold an entire class of hunters to that. Even if I am I'm being charitable and saying, we're not going to talk about trophy hunters. and not going to talk about poachers. And we're not going to talk about endangered people who hunt endangered species for whatever reason. Um, And so I'm really still trying to nail down, like, what is the practical hunting that we were talking about? And I think so far, the only one we've established is the government culling. Right. Well, so one more point about the the game hunting or the the big game hunting is a lot of this actually happens on... uh, cattle ranches that were converted into game hunting sites. So they're, it's on private land. Canned hunting. And yeah. So it's on private land. Um, that, that means that basically to, to the law, like there's, it's really hard to regulate. And I mean, conservation efforts have, I, I mean, I'm completely behind these massive conservation efforts going into these places and, and basically re-educating um the, the owners that they could, I mean canned hunting though is oh I'm so sorry to cut you off please continue well like I I do think in those cases right like since it's hard to regulate since it's going against the conservation data that I I wholeheartedly support um, re-education and replanning of that private land but in in I mean in general right at least in the United the US um, rather hunting on like um in in parks uh where it's it's legal right but i mean i don't think legality really is the defining factor here i think that if those laws are based off of data right and like i'm not appealing to the law I'm, I, I would just appeal to the research okay so just starting from the beginning the canned hunting the animals in canned hunting are bred and stocked for hunting purposes. So I don't think that is beneficial for the environment. The animals are bred specifically to be hunted. Um, I mean, I'd have to see like specifically like a few case studies or like an analysis of case studies on. Well, on so that. I think, I believe it was in uh, South Africa um, let me find the exact number for you. Um, yeah, in South Africa, 8,000 lions are being kept in about 2,600 intensive breeding operations purely for hunting stock. But even in the United States, um, let's pull up a canned hunting map. But I think this is also like disanalogous to like the, I mean, what was like generally intended with the original proposition, um, like wild I mean, I strongly implied like wild hunting, but um, it, it seems like you want to saddle me with um, all of these other things and like lump all these other um, side conversations into the mean. But it's not a side conversation when you invoked canned hunting about using the cattle ranches to be used as hunting grounds. I mean, can we can we just agree like the for the main um, proposition, right? What I came here to to 
um, defend still stands? Like that has not been defeated? I, I don't agree because I'm still trying to figure out what hunting is beneficial if we're not talking about canned hunting, we're not talking about poaching, we're not talking about subsistence, and we're not talking about trophy hunting, and we're not talking about game hunting. The only thing left are government calling. Well, I mean, if you want to, like, if you want to call it um, just calling, right? I, I think that, <clears throat> I mean, I don't see why. Um, I mean, call, hunt, I, call it what you will. Um, but how, how would that, like, break the differences that we can make out of that study? If we oh, I, 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 don't, I don't believe that it, it would be a symmetry breaker, but I am saying that all of these kinds of hunting, which do occur in reality, which do implicate... Um, all of these consequences that we've brought up, like extinction, and which do have effects on the data that you purport to rely on, um, I think the only thing left is the government-sponsored or government-approved mass culling. Unless you can come up with an example of another kind of hunting. Well, let's say... So, I'll use an analogy here again. So, let's just say that uh, there was 99 types of vegan diets, um, and then they were all unhealthy. But then the one, uh, there was one healthy vegan diet, and you you were clear from the very start that you only support that one t- type of vegan diet. And when you healthy, everybody agreed with you, and you only came, since you only came to really defend that um, after they agreed with you. And they they couldn't lobby anything against that. They started giving you examples of like other unhealthy vegan diets. They showed you all the ninety nine other ones, and they pointed to those. And you said, "Look, like the only vegan diet I suppose is the one that meets this criteria." And they show you keep showing you uh, diets that don't meet your uh, criteria. Um, well, I'm really just asking what that one diet in this situation is, um, because you talk about how I I'm saddling you with bad examples and how I'm working you into a corner. Um, but really you're working me into a corner by saying that I'm not allowed to bring up the very real and very commonplace hunting tactics, um, that are going to have an effect on whatever this imaginary one kind of hunting is that is the responsible hunting. Well, I mean, it's, it, it doesn't seem contentious to say that there's irresponsible hunting, um, if you or like anyone um, listening came here to like watch me defend irresponsible hunting, um, I'm sorry, but that's that's not what uh, I actually intended with the. the de- so what is what is this responsible hunting? Yeah, so it meets conservation codes, and that those codes are based off data, and that um, the hunting actually. The hunters actually follow those codes. Okay, so are we back to talking about legality? Well, so it's not the legality per se, right? It's it's what those regulations are based on. And if they're based on data, like these studies here funded by the conservation societies in Canada, I feel like this is reliable data and we should be deploying it. Um, as well as I mean, other let's not forget content. that I provided you with data. I I agree, and we should we should be deploying all of these. Um, so we should be t- to your point. I agree. Um, uh, natural predators should be reintroduced into the ecosystem, um, but I don't think they could be reintroduced into every ecosystem. So in which case, we should have, and we we are currently. Um, uh, we, I saw you just posted. Uh, right. Uh, so this one, I forgot to post this one, um, subsistence hunting. But the I've provided more data than predator reintroduction. I also showed how hunted areas of the Amazon rainforest have less biodiversity. Yeah, so... And I've also provided you data about how legal hunting in Central and South Africa... Um, has had a negative impact on the overall economy and the environment in those areas. Well, so in, in these areas, I mean, first off, one major issue is like the, the lack of control. And, um, in the paper, I 
cited their own island, so there's rigorous control and long-term follow-up. Um, but I, I don't disagree that there can be other things that we can do besides hunting that are good for the environment. That would, that would be silly to say. Um, is that what you're arguing for? No, I'm just saying that there have been recorded instances where hunting has been detrimental to the environment, and I have provided data of that. So let's not just say that you no, I, I agree. One yeah, study yeah. that had this this nice control, um, and that's the end of it. Um, and and it does seem a little bit difficult to argue the case that. Only responsible hunters are only the ones that follow the laws, only those laws that are supported by the data that exists at the time that is accurate data and flawed data. Absolutely. Well, I mean, like, that seems like a good definition of responsible hunting. But where is that? Um, and, well, I think that we could make, uh, we could extract this data, not just to British Columbia. I think it applies to most, probably most of North America and probably um, certain areas of the UK um, where, I mean, there's other overpopulations of deer um, across Europe. So given that how much control was in this one, and typically when people think of hunting as a, just a general heuristic, uh, I think most people think of like hunting deer or like things like that. Um, but they're, they're again, right. In, in every area, there's like, they tightly monitor the population sizes and, and we do this simple, just simple mathematic calculations. We, uh, as can easily estimate herd sizes. And when we, when we actually do bank on, um, good research, I think that, um, I, I think I think that just because um, like these examples that you've brought up are also good for the ecosystem, they don't discredit the, that hunting also can be good for the ecosystem. Um, and again, these are based off like um, not just random guesses. We're not just attacking a certain species. We're we're very clear about who we're hunting and why we're hunting them. So proper hunting shouldn't just be like random subsistence hunting or um cherry picking in th in the reverse right because you you could select good species to hunt you could also select bad species to hunt uh like big game hunting uh can cause massive detriments to uh herds i just think that like misconstruing it or like pretending to not get it at this point is just going around in circles Okay, so let's let's go to that point of why we're hunting, because I think it's important to note that the animals that we are legally allowed to hunt are because the hunters like hunting those animals. I mean, obviously, there's exceptions with the endangered species, but you can still legally hunt in species and import those animals if you have a permit. Um, so animals like coyotes, like bear, like mountain lion, like deer and possum and squirrel and birds. Um, these are all animals that you can hunt with a license. And it's not because of some conservation measure. It's because hunters want to hunt them. And then it's a post hoc rationalization to say we're doing it out of conservation. Well, I don't, I don't know if it's post hoc or not. Um, but one way or another, we definitely do need to do something about the overpopulation issue or like the inv invasive species issue, right? Like I would, I would openly advocate um, that like invasive, invasive species should uh, be kept in check as well. I mean, the, like these things are like widely known um, at least in, I mean, there, there are other examples, right? In uh, like Australia, wild horses are, are just um, obliterating the environment, uh, wild hogs across the United States. So it's not just deer, right? But when people think of hunting, like we we think of we think of these species. Um, if you don't have a background in hunting, like you're not really going to know, or you're just going to like lobby like these like 
these these cases, which I mean, I think most hunters would agree that uh, hunting species to extinction is like very bad. That's not the purpose or the premise of uh, of hunting, in my in my opinion, but of many others. Um. Okay. <laughs> so, invasive species, right? Um, at least with m- most mammals, you have to eliminate something like 85 to 90 percent to delay their rebound for at least a several years. And so you are calling a massive portion of their population. And it's simply not feasible to do that. And this is why we have seen the spread of wild hogs throughout the south, uh, southern United States. And I, I I don't know much about the horses in Australia, so I'll grant you that it's very likely that they are doing that. However, as mammals, and given that they have the ability to reproduce as mammals do, um, I'm going to go ahead and assume that their biology is similar enough that they would be able to rebound if you do not call the majority of their population. So at least more than 50%, um, which seems like it's simply not feasible to do. Rather, we should be using all of the energy, time, money, and manpower that is used in these failing calling operations towards something that actually works, like hormonal um, immunocontraceptives. We know um, we know swine physiology very, very well, and this has been demonstrated in agricultural where we have it down to the fraction of a degree at which to keep a hog house to be able to um, have their reproductive cycle timed perfectly and to be able to produce the most amount of piglets. Like that is intense knowledge of swine physiology. And so to say that we can't develop an immunocontraceptive for an animal that we know so well whose physiology is so similar to ours, I think is dishonest when we have the means to do it and it would be more effective and more beneficial for the environment. However, we stick by tradition to try and cull these animals, which is proving every year to not work. Well, I mean, with the contraceptive uh, point, I think that that could possibly be... uh, be a good thing uh if I, I i there's still a couple points a little bit of what you're saying so you said that like the the hunting or control of these species uh is not feasible but i think i mean like hunters are paying right for hunting licenses like they're actually paying to go and have uh the opportunity to to harvest uh invasive animals uh and target animals so we could take uh, the hunting of, I mean, so the whole reason why a species is called uh, invasive, right, is because it doesn't have uh, a natural purpose there. Uh, so it's not going to have any natural predators. And that's why like things like wild hogs, for example, are, are causing so much ruckus because their numbers are blowing out of proportion. And without a natural predator, um, we're going to... Like basically, we have we can't rely on uh, nature to t- take care of this uh, since it's out of balance. And if we did, right, like let's say we did introduce um, their natural predator, we would be introducing a, a secondary invasive species. So that could have even. I mean, wouldn't you agree that that could cause um, even more detriment? Uh, by it would be an indigenous predator if it was the predator that's indigenous to that area. It wouldn't be an invasive species. But so like, let's, let's take wild hogs, for example. So they're actually pretty big. Uh, like something like, uh, like a small wolf or a coyote um, probably wouldn't be able to take them down. Oh, um, absolutely I'm not, I'm not. not. No, they are like hundreds of pounds. Right. So they, if, if we're introducing like, like giant wolf packs into an ecosystem that oh i agree that, i agree that predator reintroduction probably wouldn't work in the south but i i wholeheartedly be, agree that immunocontraceptives would work much better well it wouldn't be um it wouldn't be reintroduction right it would be total and just like new introduction mm-hmm. so you'd be 
I mean, with wolves it would be, but there are natural predators that were in the southern United States. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I I think that in the in the cases of in, invasive species, the reason why there's such a problem is that there are no natural predators to uh, to keep them in check. Which is why something like hunting, right? I mean, like immunocontraceptives, like that. That's another idea. Like these are both great, like great ideas. But I think that hunting in in those areas, right, would yield positive results. I I don't see based on. But it hasn't proven to do so. It we have been doing this for at least a decade at this point, and it simply doesn't work. Otherwise, we wouldn't Wait. still be having this problem. There's, well, there's an issue, right? That without without hunting, right? And if we didn't if we didn't hunt, um, you can't say that there would have been better or worse outcomes um, otherwise. Like the chances are, it could have been far far worse. This is the false dichotomy hunting. again. This is saying hunting or no hunting with no interjection for any other kind of alternative. Would, no, I agree. I I'm not suspending these alternatives, right? Um, the thing is, is when we have hunters actually paying to to go and hunt, I think it's uh, it's obviously free to do that, right? I mean, you gotta you gotta pay conservation officers, but like they're they're paid through hunt, the hunting license system. So the system runs itself. If something like contraceptives, right, that's gonna be right. You gotta run all kinds of tests to see if that's even that can even work. If that's worthwhile, very expensive, and Again, I think uh, it doesn't discredit hunting just because I mean, we want to talk cost benefit. The the southern hogs are causing like millions, if not billions, of dollars every year in damage, and so it seems to me that to spend um, you know one million dollars on initial research and then one million every year in deployment after that is going to save the government money. Right. But okay. So let me just, let's just for sake of argument, let's just grant the whole immunocon because I don't want to get into a huge like, like tangent on immunocontraceptives. I, th- I think that if they work, like that's great. That doesn't mean that hunting doesn't work though. So, but I it still, hasn't still- proven to work. We keep seeing yes, yes the hog population yes. rebound every single year. Yeah, of course. Of course these populations rebound nobody's saying that they don't rebound but what we're saying is that it, when we have a control um which w- from what you're saying you're not basing it off like any kind of control um we do have control we actually do see these kinds of benefits at least um off the coast of british columbia on an island but i'm not sure what kind of control would even be feasible for this when it just shows it doesn't work if the hog population keeps increasing i think it's safe to say that the hunting measures as extreme as they are don't work we can also talk about burmese pythons in florida where they have uh, a government funded initiative to tell the citizens of florida to kill as many burmese pythons as they possibly can they are paid to kill the pythons they Um, hire contractors, and that is their full-time job. And even then, even the government scientists have stated that it is not enough. Right, but that's sort of like a straw man of... So it's not a... You have to obviously have recurring, like, hunting seasons, right, to keep populations in check. Because you can't... um, just like wipe out all the deer because uh, there could be even more consequences to that. Like how do we, how They're do we trying not- to totally eradicate the Burmese python because it is an invasive species. Right. And I mean, if that's, if that's true, that this species is doing absolutely no good for the environment whatsoever, I think that it, I mean, most people would agree that they have to be eradicated or removed. Right. But, but and so they're going hunting- through it. Like each every one that you hunt, right, is going to be like one token towards um, less and less and less damage. And as not as when reach, one has the when if you hunt one male, if you kill one male bird python, there is still another male that can inseminate God knows how many females, which can each lay one hundred and fifty eggs. 
it is a drop in the bucket. And so that's why the estimates state that you have to kill between 80 and 90 percent of a population to totally eradicate it. And even more so with reptiles who have the ability to reproduce by the hundreds. So so what I'm trying to like get at here is like it seems like what you're saying is that like hunting them is actually bad. Like, why would that be bad for the environment? Like, because why would the contrary be true? It seems like if I hunt one, even if it's a drop in the bucket, it still seems like it's a it's a positive drop in the bucket, not a negative drop in the bucket. Because now we are employing government scientists and um, government field workers and Fish and Wildlife Service to micro to manage a failing program, a program that they have admitted will not eradicate the Burmese python and they are giving free reign to people to do it by whatever means they choose. And so they can go through it in ways that are hostile. They can go through it in ways that are inhumane and um, leaves open the possibility that they are going into these very fragile environments like the Everglades. Just to be um, clear, I, I, don't think the, I, I don't think the inhumane thing is like really relevant to the debate. They are part of the like, environment. Well, like killing them, like, I mean, I don't think like letting them suffer is like a good thing. I think that's horrible, but I, I just don't think it's relevant to, I just want to steer us back to the, the debate proposition. I mean, leaving, leaving aside that they can go through it in inhumane methods towards individuals who are part of the environment, we can put that aside. However, to give people free reign to kill indiscriminately in a program, you are wasting everybody's time, money, and all of these efforts and manpower for a failing proposition where you could be using the same people and the same resources to actually do something, to actually use the methods that have been proven through the hormone trials to actually eradicate the Burmese python. But instead, because there is money to be made in the eradication of the Burmese python through hunting, this is the method that they have chosen to use. Well, I mean, I, th I think they should definitely do the trials on the, um, like the method you're, you're trying to uh, espouse. And I, I think that that would probably, I mean, in that case, right, like that could be far, far better. But it doesn't mean that um, like hunting them is like bad. Um, it might be bad economically. Like you said, there's like, like I mean, that's like, again, tangential from the uh, to be good for the environment or, or not. It seems like they're an invasive species. Um, any single one of them, even though it's a drop in the bucket, it's going to be a good thing. Even if it costs a lot of money, if it's detrimental to the economy, I don't think that's really relevant. It's, it seems like another conversation. So then let's talk about when, let's talk about coyotes. So coyotes in the Northern United States are invasive. However, they have taken up the niche of the wolf, which has been largely eradicated. Um, now, coyotes fall into the kind of species that's considered a, nu a nuisance species and are allowed to be hunted in most states indiscriminately um, without a hunting season um, for essentially any reason. And in Vermont specifically, you don't need a reason to kill a coyote. Um, they are open season, open target, open game. All, just to be clear, I would, I would yeah, just to be clear, I mean, um, we can look at the research there, but um, before we go into it, I, I personally would never um, just hunt um, for the sake of just killing. Um, so just because it's a pest, um, even though, because it, it sounds like you're saying it actually has a good ecological purpose. So I would obviously get behind that. So the hunting of the coyote, however, has proven to be very detrimental um, to other species in the ecosystem and to the individual coyote packs themselves, because coyotes have a very strict pack structure that revolves around an alpha male and an alpha female, and those are the only two breeding pairs. However, um, it was the, if I remember correctly, Colorado um, stopped coyote hunting or at least put severe limit limitations on it. And comparing the two, what they were able to draw from these studies is that 
by disrupting the pack structure, by killing the alpha male or killing the alpha female, uh, this disrupted pack structure led to juveniles who were more aggressive towards humans and more aggressive uh, towards livestock animals and uh, less in, um, less afraid of humans and so more willing to come to um, human environments, human built environments. And so there was more human coyote conflict. There was also um, more conflict among the coyote packs because all of these established territories were now in flux because of this pack structure being um, essentially broken up. And so you saw negative detriment uh, to the coyotes, but also to the prey species. So these juvenile coyotes, because they didn't have this strict pack structure anymore, um, were less efficient hunters and were going after, um, quote, easier targets, which usually happened to be chickens or domesticated birds, um, but were less efficient at hunting. So it's a less robust individual, um, at least as juveniles. And so they were also observed to be unable to relearn that strict cohesion and strict pack structure. And so through hunting, we saw many negative effects um, towards human coyote interactions, coyote, coyote interactions, as well as the interactions with the prey species. Well, again, I, I, I mean, with coyotes in, in particular, um, I understand that hunting can be detrimental to them and depending on the ecosystem is how they're going to be good or bad for the ecosystem. And my position doesn't pivot off legality. So if these laws aren't, are actually not founded in conservation, uh, or if they're misplaced, like in the example that you gave, I think it's, it's disanalogous to my position. Do you have an argument for why it would be, would actually be analogous to my position? I'll be honest, I really, I'm not trying to play dumb, but I really am struggling to come up with what exact form of hunting your position is taking. If it is not, pure, I understand so far what you've said is it is the legal hunting that is based off of these most sound data. But I think that's just not realistic. That is not the kind of hunting and that's world that we currently live in. And so maybe in this dream world, there could be some minor form of hunting that wouldn't be an active detriment towards the environment. Um, but that's unrealistic. And if that is the debate you're willing to have, I'm not, I'm not even sure how somebody could counteract that. Well, presumably with like counter data that actually um, like attacks that proposition, uh, and I mean, I've, I've laid out my criteria. I'm like, if, if you need more time to prepare, we could always like reconvene. Uh, I'm just, just not to be sure clear what from, data it actually would ever exist to show that, to show that well, um, there is this kind of hunting that is both legal and well-founded and it's bad for the environment because I think I have that up. I have showed yeah, that yeah, we're yeah. in, in central Africa, totally legal hunting has taken place that has been detrimental to the environment. And in the Amazon, totally legal subsistence, minor impact hunting um, has been detrimental to the environment. And in the Americas, subsistence hunting, which is competing with every other form of hunting, has contributed to food scarcity. Well, I mean, there, I'm sure there's other ways you can like, attack it, right? Like, I don't know if there's like a paper on like PTSD other wild animals might have from seeing hunters, um, which, you know, like any, any other, I, again, right. So f f just to be clear, my, my personal position is we should be hunting other predators. I think that the predominance of data shows that predators in general are good. Uh, they're also necessary. And with the other paper I shared above that, uh, an overabundance of deer actually leads to massive detriment of, the ecology. So they, they do need to be kept in check one way or another. Contraceptives are one way. I'm not arguing against con contraceptives. Um, if those could be deployed and I mean, if um, the, like every government could figure that out in their local area, I, I would love to see that. Um, but I mean, as it currently stands, it seems like hunting uh, and regulated hunting um, in coalition with conservation efforts is an incredibly beneficial uh, and necessary components to the environment. And 
again, I'm, I'm not opposed to where, um, where practical reintroducing, uh, like, uh, natural, uh, predators, but I, I don't think that we're going to be able to do that everywhere. Um, and in, in, again, those other areas where these predators are, are not going to be able to control or discern, uh, as wisely as hunters could hunters can select, uh, with more discretion than a uh, starving wolf can. I think that in these areas, hunting is still going to be essential unless we come up with some al- al- like alternative method. But I've, I, again, I haven't even seen any data on that. So I wouldn't really have a position there, but as it stands, I, I still just, I support hunting. I think you should support hunting in, in th- these contexts. I think most people should also get on board with that. Um, unless there are, there are any reasons like not to do it. Like if, if you have some ethical reason to not do it, then, um, that, that would be a a tangential issue. Um, uh, the, the ethics, right. I, I can get on board with the ethics, but again, I think most people want thriving ecosystems. So if there's something that's necessary to do now and we can solve this ethically in some other way, that would be like very, very good. So to me, that sounded like a closing statement. So I'm going to go ahead and make a closing statement if that's okay with you. Sure. All right. So uh, we just started, we started this debate with um, hunting is beneficial to the environment. However, we narrowed that hunting um, to a very narrow subset of hunting that is not the majority of hunting. So we said um, the very obvious detrimental parts of hunting like poaching and like hunting to extinction, we're going to go ahead and exclude, even though those are the reality of the situation. Um, We went ahead and um, excluded subsistence hunting, even though that is the the least impactful form of hunting, um, but it does compete with every other form of hunting. And so even, even though it is the least impactful form um, and it is a legal form of hunting, um, it is still driving those negative consequences that we see with every other kind of hunting. So we're not talking about canned hunting. Um, we're not talking about trophy hunting, poaching, subsistence hunting, um, or any other form of hunting. I think so far the place that we've been able to land is the legal government-controlled um, culling of animals um, and, and moving from that. And so in the beginning, you introduced evidence that on an island, there was the, the use of hunting to call deer species. However, I contested that by saying it was hunting that put those islands in that vulnerable position and that hunting is merely a band-aid rather than a solution. And so I believe that I have fairly asserted that the majority of hunting Um, that has been discussed here has proven to be detrimental to the environment. Um, And I certainly haven't heard anything that shows that any natural environment that hasn't been degraded by hunting necessarily needs hunting as an intervention. Um, So I, I, I don't think that the point has been proven that hunting is beneficial to the environment. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, just to be clear to everyone, uh, if you're voting, make sure you're voting in accordance with the actual proposition. The proposition wasn't hen- hunting is necessary for the environment; it was hunting is beneficial. And I feel like if that was, if you feel like that was demonstrated to you, or if it was not demonstrated to you, um, vote in accordance with that. Uh, thanks for hosting, Stone Shepherd. Yeah, thank you for stepping up to the plate and. To everyone listening, it's exactly what Slayer said. Base your vote on that proposition and also base your vote on uh, who performed better in the debate and who had the better argument if you really think that that proposition was defended or if the opposition really did well in opposing that. And yeah, thank you both again for stepping up and debating it. I was very, very entertained by this debate and I think I speak for everyone in saying that they were very entertained by it too. So uh, yeah, just following that, just everyone please direct your attention to the debate chat text channel i posted a poll so yeah just base your vote off of that and thanks again guys appreciate it thank you